This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, April 30th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. We begin in Nigeria, where at least 700 people, among them young students, have been kidnapped in just the last five months. Worried and frustrated parents of the kidnapped victims are pleading for government help. Soraya Ali of Reuters has this report. When Linda Peter last spoke to her daughter, it was a phone call from her captors. They demanded ransom, but the mother had nothing to give. Now, at a meeting with other parents, she's asking the state for help. Her 18-year-old daughter, Jennifer, was among the 39 students abducted by gunmen on March 11th from a forestry college in the northwestern Nigerian state of Kaduna. The captors, who called from the teenager's phone, threatened to kill the male students and force the females into marriage. The Kaduna governor has repeatedly said his state government will not negotiate with the, quote, bandits or pay ransoms. But Linda says they must do more. I thought the security would stand up to help us because some people, they will kidnap them, they will not reach three weeks or two days. They will go and bring them out because they have the money they demand, but we don't have anything. Much of the fear felt by Linda and other worried parents at the meeting stems from the killing of five of the students kidnapped from Greenfield University on April 21st, elsewhere in the state. <laughs> on the same day as the meeting, Dorothy Johanna, one of the dead Greenfield students, was buried. Speaking at the funeral, her father, Johanna Meck, said the government should learn from the tragedy. The government should be proactive. They should not just keep quiet. They should be proactive to help the situation because it's getting out of hand. Kidnapping for ransom has become an industry in northern Nigerian states. Over 700 people have been abducted at education institutions since December. President Mohamedou Buhari told state governments in February that rewarding such crimes with money and vehicles could boomerang disastrously. That was Soraya Ali of Reuters reporting. Kenya said on Thursday it had told the United Nations it will shut by June 2022 two camps holding over 410,000 refugees who fled from wars in the eastern horn of Africa. The East African nation plans to repatriate some and give others residency. The Interior Ministry made the announcement on Twitter about five weeks after ordering the closure of the Dadaab and Kakuma refugee camps and giving the United Nations two weeks to present a plan to carry this out. The UN Refugee Agency replied by asking the government to ensure that vulnerable refugees would still be protected under its timeline for the closure. A Nairobi spokesperson for the UNHCR did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the latest announcement. Thursday's announcement appeared to be the decisive step by Kenya after years of discussion about closing data. U.S. President Joe Biden is touting a range of accomplishments as he hits the milestone of 100 days in office. But has he made any impact on the African continent? Viewers Anita Powell reports from Johannesburg. U.S. President Joe Biden has focused most of his energy in his first 100 days in office on taming the pandemic on home soil. In this short, frantic period, though, he has made a few important gestures that have been welcomed in Africa. On his first day in office, he halted the U.S. plan to exit the World Health Organization. Biden's reversal of predecessor Donald Trump's controversial decision to withdraw from the global body was greeted with near-universal approval, especially from African health experts, who said this could portend a more equitable world order. Biden also pledged an additional $2 billion to the COVAX facility, which aims to provide equitable vaccine access to poorer nations. And then on day 90, April 20th, he spoke words that echoed across the ocean. We can't leave this moment or look away thinking our work is done. 
We have to look at it. We have to we have to look as, as we did for those nine minutes and 29 seconds. We have to listen. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Those are George Floyd's last words. We can't let those words die with him. We have to keep hearing those words. George Floyd, an African-American, was born in Houston and murdered in Minneapolis. But the African continent watched keenly as a jury handed a guilty verdict to his killer, ex-policeman Derek Chauvin. Floyd's slow suffocation under Chauvin's knee, which led to his death, was a linchpin for protests and calls for police reform in the United States. African analysts such as Asanda Guasheng, a Cape Town-based diversity trainer and gender and race scholar, welcomed Biden's admission that the U.S. has a racial justice problem. South Africa is also struggling to overcome its own racial justice issues after centuries of colonialism and the brutal, racist apartheid regime. She also said Vice President Kamala Harris's status as a powerful black female leader lends weight to Biden's desire to address racial justice, but said she wants to see more from the administration and from American institutions. We praise Kamala, and I think it's great that we praise her, but people of color in institutionally racist institutions very rarely are able to make any change. And so unless and until we deal with the systems and the structures that keep prejudice in place, we are not going to see many changes in the United States and globally. And so yay and great for America and then Biden, but can we please talk about the institutional change that they are going to make Johannesburg-based commentator Brooke Spector said that while Biden hasn't made any big changes to Africa policy, the fact that he isn't making radical, impulsive changes, as critics accuse Trump of doing, is a welcome change in itself. Spector recommends that Biden work to strengthen and maintain the African Growth and Opportunities Act, a U.S. trade program. Much of what has to happen is going to be demonstrated by doing things on the ground in a slow, steady consistent pattern rather than these uh, hectic uh, policy changes of chopping and changing. If you want to demonstrate your support for economic growth on the continent, then you, you carry out the policies that encourage economic growth. Specter, who served as an American diplomat overseas for several decades, says time will tell on Biden's impact on Africa. Presidential legacies, he said, are built over years, not days, even 100 of them. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. Reports of police violence and racial injustice resonate especially strongly in France with its large population of ethnic Africans and Arabs, yet cautious optimism by some in the United States and elsewhere that the guilty verdict in American former police officer Derek Chauvin's murder trial might trigger societal change is less shared in France. From the Paris suburb of Bobigny, Lisa Brandt reports for VOA. One, unintentional second-degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Derek Chauvin's trial for the killing of African-American George Floyd made headline news in France, but much of the reporting about the proceedings and their underlying themes of police violence and racism largely zoomed in on the United States. I think it's uh, viewed as an American problem with some resonance in France. Uh, it also feeds into a certain strain of French anti-Americanism so, uh, on the left and on the right, uh, so that the French can moralize about uh, the United States and its, uh, its difficulties and its flaws. Floyd's death in police custody caused many French to look inward. Last year, they joined global protests for police accountability. Many chanted the name of 24-year-old Adama Traoré, whose family says he died under similar circumstances to Floyd, although that claim is disputed. The black American's death opened a broader spigot here of soul-searching about France's colonial past and continuing injustice justices today. French authorities found zero tolerance for police racism and brutality and promised to ban a controversial police chokehold. President Emmanuel Macron called racial profiling unbearable. 
Police representatives deny there is systemic racism. They say police are overworked and underappreciated as they tackle violence in tough neighborhoods, sometimes becoming targets of terrorism. La police nationale n'est pas raciste. The national police is not racist. To the contrary, it's Republican and diverse from all ethnic origins and religions. There may be problematic individuals, but the force itself isn't racist. Critics say otherwise. A 2017 report by an independent citizen's rights body found young black or Arab-looking men in France are five times more likely to be stopped for police identity checks than the rest of the population. Last November saw four Paris police officers suspended after TV footage showed them punching a black music producer. In January, six non-governmental groups announced the country's first class action lawsuit over a alleged racial profiling by police. We've been struggling with the state for 10 years. We, uh, the French Supreme Court convicted the, the state in, uh, in November 2016 for, discrimina for discrimination. And after that, we could have expected from the state for a, uh, we should actually uh, respect the rule of law to do some police reform. They have done nothing. It's a story heard many times before in France. Activists point to bigger, long-standing inequalities going far beyond policing. Some aren't waiting for change from the top. In the Paris suburb of Bobigny, youth group Nouvelle Elan 93 is mentoring youngsters, helping them with schoolwork and giving them alternatives to the streets where they are vulnerable. We are trying to push them to reach the maximum of their potential because many of them are talented in sports, music, theater, everything. Cases of police violence are taken personally. These kind of things don't just happen to others. They could happen to us as well. I'm black, I'm affected. There is a close relationship here in values between the protest for George Floyd and for Adama Traore. He and other activists say it will take time for the lessons from Floyd's death and France's colorblind creed of liberty, equality and fraternity to take hold. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Bobigny, France. It's been a tense few days in Jerusalem and along the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip. In Jerusalem, Israeli police and Palestinians have clashed repeatedly and in Gaza, Palestinians fired dozens of rockets at southern Israel, provoking Israeli airstrikes. The heightened tensions during the holy month of Ramadan have people on both sides worried. Linda Gradstein reports from Jerusalem. The clashes in East Jerusalem happened in the evenings after worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Old City broke their Ramadan fast. They were protesting police barricades that made it impossible for them to congregate at the Damascus Gate. Palestinians, when they go to the evening prayers in Alaska Mosque, they like to rest in this area afterwards on these stairs. But the occupation doesn't like the presence of Palestinians in this area. It is a matter of sovereignty. Israeli forces have since removed those barricades, which Palestinians celebrated as a victory. At the same time, Gaza Palestinians fired dozens of rockets at southern Israel, sending Israelis running to their bomb shelters. Israel launched airstrikes in response and warned of a larger, broader response if the rocket fire continues. Israel has a lot of things that can do and can you, and even use kind of escalation. I'm not speaking about a full-scale escalation, but limited escalation to attack sensitive targets of Hamas inside Gaza that we didn't do it until now. Some analysts blame Hamas for provoking the tensions in Jerusalem and Gaza as part of a strategy to raise their profile in advance of next month's Palestinian elections. Hamas uh, is looking for a pretext to, to heighten tensions because they want to uh, be, be seen uh, on the Palestinian street as the champion of Palestinian interests, especially uh, related to Jerusalem and especially during Ramadan. Some more moderate Palestinians dream of a different Jerusalem. I feel very sad about what's happening because I feel that this is not my Jerusalem. My Jerusalem is the 
a city of peace, city of tolerance, city of acceptance, sitting, city in which the three Abrahamic faiths attached to Jerusalem, respect each other, acknowledge each other, and live together. But for now, that vision of peace is still only a dream. Linda Gradstein for VOA News, Jerusalem. Would like to hear what you think about Africa 54? Join the discussion on Facebook. Our address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a captivating new music video by Ghanaian artist Sharifa Gunu. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54. NASA astronaut Michael Collins, who made history as part of the 1969 Apollo 11 crew to first land a person on the moon, has died at the age of 90. In interviews with VOA's Ken Farabaugh, Collins reflected on the importance of the mission and the contributions of the astronauts of his era, while keeping a focus on the future of crewed spaceflight and exploration. Well, I was in this group here, yeah. somewhere. Michael Collins grew up with his sights set on the stars. But he joked the one he actually orbited, Earth's moon, wasn't the destination of his dreams. I'm a Martian. Uh, I think uh, Mars is the next great uh, destination. While he never set foot on Mars, nor the moon, Collins made history as part of NASA's groundbreaking Corps of Astronauts selected for the Apollo missions of the 1960s and 1970s. He was the fourth human to conduct a spacewalk during the Gemini program. But it's his role as the Columbia Command Module pilot during the 1969 Apollo 11 mission, when astronauts landed on the moon for the first time, that he is remembered for most. His job was to pilot the spacecraft, orbiting the moon alone while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin explored the surface. After a rendezvous, they all returned safely to Earth. Collins credited the thousands of workers on the ground at NASA for the historic achievement of their mission and the overall success of the Apollo program. It was a wonderful uh, example of organization within a large government agency. That's something we don't see too much of today. After traveling around the world celebrating the Apollo 11 mission, he retired from NASA. While working at the U.S. State Department, Collins was tapped to be a liaison for NASA to the White House during the 1970 Apollo 13 crisis. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. He updated President Richard Nixon on the status of getting the crippled spacecraft safely back to Earth. And he wanted us, really somebody to tell him yes or no. The answer was yes, and Collins believed Apollo 13, known as NASA's successful failure, was a turning point for American interest in crude spaceflight. It made NASA and the American public more aware of some of the hazards involved in flying to the moon and back, and I think it, uh, it focused attention. Collins wrote about his life as an Air Force test pilot and his missions into space and the moon in a 1974 book titled Carrying the Fire. In interviews with VOA, Collins preferred to look ahead rather than behind. And he said there was a lack of momentum and urgency in accomplishing new goals in space. Astronauts and former astronauts, we're very pro-space, so uh, I'm pro-accelerating the exploration of space. Collins believed the planet that inspired him as a child, Mars, the subject of his 1990 book, Mission to Mars, should be NASA's ultimate focus. My friend Neil Armstrong thought that uh, going back to the moon was a, uh, a proper and necessary precursor to a Mars expedition. I, uh, I'd like to bypass that, if possible. While he did not live long enough to see someone reach the surface of Mars or a return to the moon, NASA's Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter on the surface of the Red Planet today are charting new frontiers in space exploration 
that have reinvigorated public interest. I think we're on our way, perhaps more slowly than people would, would like, but nonetheless, we're on our way. Astronauts are again aiming for the moon as part of NASA's Artemis program, which plans to have crews back exactly where Collins once orbited in the next several years. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Chicago, Illinois. Videos of kids having fun are among the most popular on YouTube. They are also a fast-growing business, one that critics say comes with little regulation and oversight to protect children on either side of the screen. Michelle Quinn reports. Ryan Kaji, the nine-year-old star of Ryan's World, has 29 million subscribers on one of his YouTube channels. That audience has translated into millions of dollars in annual ad revenue for Ryan and his family, making Ryan the top earning YouTuber for the past three years. The rise of child YouTube stars represents a dramatic shift in children's content. And we're talking about millions and millions of views, children playing with toys, reviewing toys on channels, uh, YouTube families with their own channels, interacting with toys and brands. From its inception in 2005, YouTube has offered people worldwide a dream. With a camera, you can reach an audience. With families and children videoing all aspects of their lives, toy companies and retailers took note of an opportunity. They began to advertise on these channels or pay families to review their products. They have direct access now to really uh, young, uh, potentially vulnerable audiences through these, these YouTube channels. As part of a 2019 privacy settlement with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, YouTube banned targeted advertisements in videos for children. Many YouTube stars with young fans saw their ad sales drop. U.S. government regulators have pushed online influencers to disclose when they are getting paid to play with toys and other products or have received them for free. That's not the only issue. There's also the question of what it's like for the YouTube stars. Few laws and regulations protect their privacy or their working hours. When Melissa Hunter's child became an adolescent, the family's doll review YouTube channel, which started in 2012 when her child was eight, became less fun. Caden was grappling with his identity as a boy. He wanted out. He was concerned that I would freak out or be angry um, or be disappointed. And, um, and I think that is the reality for a lot of kid creators that are out there. What may have started out as something fun then becomes the family business. For child YouTube stars seeking to make a change, there's another challenge. The archive of videos on the site lives on, finding new audiences, generating a steady revenue flow. Hunter put a privacy setting on her channel's entire video archive that featured Caden. So that was his request for his 16th birthday. That did have a financial impact, and but that wasn't um, not my number one concern. It was his, um, you know, it's his right to privacy. Broadcast yourself has long been YouTube's slogan, and millions of families have done so, with some children turning into stars. Whether this is good for children on either side of the screen remains an open question. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. A new song and music video by a singer from Northern Ghana is shaking up the region with positive energy. It brings new life and meaning to a centuries old folk song as the artist herself explains. Heather Maxwell, host of Music Time in Africa, has the story. Sharif Aguru is up here again. After four years of putting her music career on hold for her family, Sharifa Gunu from Tamale, Ghana has bounced back with a brand new album and a new hit single. It's entitled Dok Peda. Dok 
This song that also features reggae dancehall artist Ross Cuckoo has been racking up thousands of YouTube views and audio max streams by Northern Ghanaians since March. <laughs> The music and the hook are catchy, that's for sure, but the real juice is in the message. What is true love? Well, Sharifa sat down earlier this week from her studio in Tamale, Ghana, to tell it to a straight. That topic of don't fear that. In the centuries, till today, we have folk songs and the stories they used to tell and the things they used to say. Ah, don't fear that. Oh, my mom, And that's a verse. And those things mean man has entered market. His lover is the tallest one among the people. Because so far as the person is your lover, no matter how the people are crowded, you will definitely see the person in the midst of the people because of what the love between you and the person become a spiritual joint. When women gathered plenty, whatever, she will be the first person for you to hear the voice because you people are connected. So we should respect relationships. So love is not a partial thing. Love is a spiritual joint. So that was Sharifa Gunu from Tamale, Ghana, with her comeback single, Dokpeda. Love is a spiritual thing. Thanks, Heather, for that wonderful music. Now on somewhat of a personal note for VOA's English to Africa service, today, we're saying farewell to Neguse Mengesha, who is retiring after serving as the African Division's director for seven years. He's been with VOA for 39 years after beginning his journalism career in his native Ethiopia. Mr. Mengesha has been more than a boss to us. He has been a friend and a mentor to many of us. We wish him well in his new adventures away from VOA. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend.